Goodness, that was a mouthful. Um, I'm glad you had to. I could never have memorized that, by the way, of all the things we do. Um, but yeah, uh, let me you know, take the next several minutes and sort of get really cerebral with all of you. Um, I'm just going to pause for a second to say that what I'm really getting to show you is probably the most statistically accurate in prognostication and prediction of neurological disease device on the market that we know of. Um, we just got FDA breakthrough. We've had a lot of great commercial traction. And so I'll try to take my time to go into a very complex topic in just a matter of a few minutes. When we think about disease and the prevalence, right, and so it's kidney disease, cardiovascular, liver, whatever, we are really doing a great job to get our hands around that. But when you think about the aging demographics of the world, one in seven people on planet Earth have some type of neurological disease. That is really stunning. Um, many of the diseases are, you know, they're clinical, but they're not going to kill you, but some will, right? And so when we think about things just here in North America, you know, we have nearly 50 million people with Alzheimer's, 10 million with Parkinson's. I mean, these are things that are basically sentences of death. And then there's certainly other dementias, so basically forgetting car keys, forgetting relatives, you know, this sort of cognitive um, decrease, and then certainly movement disorders like multiple sclerosis and others, and even schizophrenia. There are really a lot of scary diseases that impact and affect the brain. But what's going on? When you think about all the advances that we've made, and just even in that great med device we talked about, a lot of great advances have been made in measuring stuff, but not with the brain. Don't believe me? Take a look at this. In the last 20 years, we've done a great job of really kicking the butt of some ugly diseases. But what one has kicked our butt the most? kind of letting that sink in, because if, if for many of you are kind of like me, 50 and older, a recent study just came out at the beginning of the year, there are 348 million people on planet Earth with Alzheimer's. That's 20% of 50 and older. You just might be subclinical right now. But that's a really big, scary disease. And so what we have, and what I'm really encouraged about and showing, is basically a great way of measuring the brain. Cognition, how we think, how we make decisions, functions, how we move, how we squeeze things, how we walk, how we don't bump into things. We have been able to take what is resonant in terms of a set of sensors on a smart device, and over the last 20 years, not 20 months, not six months, not something that came out of college that we licensed, but something that has been worked on over multiple countries in over 30 different academic centers, hospital systems, and conjunction with pharma in a $40 million collaboration effort we did over 10 years of clinical trials and validations that we actually can give a neurological test on a smart device to an individual that is then trained against all that ground truth with thousands of people over a decade to then use AI to really say what is going on in the brain. And how we do this is we put you under something called an ecological or an ecological validity or we put you under um, a neurocognitive load and basically sort of a cross-fit for your brain in 10 minutes. And what it does is it walks you through a couple of these tests, but these tests are so sensitive, and the, and the devices and the sensors on the phone are so sensitive that we collect 800 active digital biomarkers, about 15 megs of data, and we can sit there and walk you through not only cognition, dual tasking, a lot of things that really test you, but it becomes the most predictable way of going through the dashboard of your brain. And so what do we need? Do we need a bunch of EMR data? Do we need um, you know, some other sort of give-me's? No, we need your age, your biological sex, your level of your education, and which hand you're dominant. We then go through micro-movements, attention, memory, some, again, all in less than 10 minutes, and then you now really have a dashboard for your brain. That doesn't really exist. I mean, it's not a Sudoku puzzle, it's not some kind of app, but this is truly medical grade. We received FDA a breakthrough in our ability to predict the conversion of Alzheimer's last year. We're on our way for de novo to be the first medical device to ever diagnose Alzheimer's. So in this case, what you see is the 13 cognitive domains. And so you see immediately there are three red areas. This is actually consistent with a movement disorder known as Parkinson's. Four years before the onset of symptoms. And so this predictive score, this is what we call our digital neurosignature. This score is actually our digital fingerprint. This is our AI at work. In this, in this case here, this person has a 72% likelihood of remaining non-converting, meaning they've trended down, 
But for the next year, if you're a provider, they're not going to convert into something ugly. But that's what it's about. So let's kind of talk about what is conversion, what's really important. And so without getting too much into sort of this science, but if you look at mini mental, if you look at MOCA, if you look at some of the other tests to sort of determine if you have amyloid, which is sort of the first protein that comes up in the brain that is thought to be the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's. If you're using MMSE and MOCA, you have a better chance of flipping a coin as a predictor. If you're using CANTAB, it's a little bit better than flipping a coin, but you wouldn't mortgage your house on that. We have the ability of not only detecting 87% of the time in less 10 minutes whether you have pathology in the brain, which is a great use case for pharma and many other scenarios. But if you do, we have a 94% accuracy of predicting within 12 months if you're going to convert to AD or not. Does that make sense? And so as you're thinking about if your drug company is looking for a population to which you're working on a therapeutic, how can you easily and rapidly screen a very large population and know a person has a pathology? And then confirm it if you want to with PET or MRI. But if you're also looking at does my drug work? I mean, think about it. CNS drug trials have the distinction of two things you don't want. They're the most expensive and they fail the most often. And so one of the reasons is the brain is hard to measure, right? And so it changes all the time. And so the question is, you can't improve it unless you can measure it, and certainly can't improve it unless you can measure it accurately. And so when we look at the opportunities of sort of really being able to measure the brain in a reliable, predictable, and scalable way, using smart devices, devices are certainly a great way of doing so, but it certainly makes a whole new generation of opportunity for AI-driven drug trials. So if you're doing a drug trial for Alzheimer's drug, you want to bring people back in twice a year. Another PET, another MRI, another lumbar puncture. We are statistically more accurate than all of those in our device in less than 10 minutes. And there's no learning effect. You can take this test every day for a year and you won't get better at it because there's nothing to remember. We're actually picking up on a series of conscious and subconscious responses to the inputs we're asking you. And AI gets smarter and smarter all the time. So let's talk about a real use case as I finish up here. If you're a neurologist or some, some other provider that's seen, on average, nine patients in a given day that come in with a memory complaint, I forgot my car keys, you know, something that we would call mild cognitive impairment. Statistically, if you're looking to manage those patients in the next 12 months, only one of those are actually going to convert to AD. And so if you're looking at how you're utilizing resources or any other sort of mechanism that's sort of monitoring this population, that's nine pets, nine MRIs, and nine lumbar punctures to find one person. Give them the test during the triage portion of the visit, and you know with a 94% accuracy which one of those nine are going to convert. And so that's some really, really good stuff. So does it, is, are we having commercial traction? So as I said, we worked on this for about 20 years. Um, we really kind of came out of the stealth mode, if you will, at the um, beginning of last year. We have already secured bookings and contracts for over $11 million. Um, and so we really know that there is strong need in the market, not only if your drug company is building the next generation of Alzheimer's drugs, or if you are GN Hearing that makes hearing aids and Jabra and other sort of consumer electronics that are trying to get into the brain health space or you're a digital therapeutics company, and you're trying to titrate your latest drug. So just to wrap up, um, you know, we've raised some money, not a lot. We'll get ready um, to announce uh, shortly that we just did another smaller raise. Um, we will be announcing our Series B raise appetite in, say, the next month. And then one last thing, since I have just a few more seconds on the clock, not only is this a great way to determine neurodegenerative diseases like we know of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, et cetera, but we did a 1,000 patients study in Q4 of last year to find healthy. We wanted just more healthy people to enrich our data source. 264 of these people did not look like the others. And we're like, what's going on? And we had digital noise, as we call it. And it was just a distinct signature. Those people actually had COVID and had recovered. And so as we think about the things that are impacting us, whether it's genetic, whether it's environmental, whether it's viral or pandemic, and we now have a patent on this, but we have an 87% statistical accuracy of diagnosing you with COVID long haulers, and we weren't even looking for it. And in case you're wondering, your cognitive processing speed if you have COVID long haulers is actually worse than if you have full-blown AD. Thank you. <laughs>